plan to go to Dubai actually started right after regionals of this past year. So Travis didn't make it to the games. And as a professional athlete, we know that these types of setbacks can happen. Now, obviously, it just sucks to have to go through it. But when it does happen, you got to sit down and come up with some sort of a plan for like, all right, how do we navigate this next year? And what's our plan of action? Definitely was not what I kind of had in my future goals for that year. Um, so then ended up going demo team, kind of gained a different perspective, fired me up for the upcoming year. Now with that, being a professional athlete in CrossFit, having money that provides my family, pays for my house, puts diapers on my baby's bottom, you know, those are important things. And I know everybody has different goals and right now one of those is winning money. And so right when the season was done, I planned on picking a few events that had some bigger prize purse and I've done Dubai in the past and they pay really well and it's a really well run event. So the main goal prior before this even became a sanctioned event was to go to Dubai. And Dubai had been this big competition, a lot of prize money. Travis has had good experiences out there. He's been on the podium. So that was obviously a, a very clear next step for us. It allowed us to refocus Travis's training pretty quickly, like right off the bat after regionals. So it's like, all right, well, this is the next competition we're preparing for. This is what our target is for doing it. This is how we're gonna evaluate the next training season. I've heard from multiple sources that the 2019 CrossFit Games season is going to be significantly different, including the possibility of eliminating regionals entirely. Buckle up, because things are about to get very crazy. When CrossFit first came out and announced that the whole season and was changing and everybody was fired and no one really knew what was going on. And then the events start to unfold that Dubai becomes this sanctioned event that the winning athlete, both individual male, individual female, and team that wins this competition gets the first bid to the CrossFit Games and there's no more regionals. So now the stakes of this competition go way up. Me and Travis sit down, we know like, all right, the competitive field's probably gonna get deeper. Some of the bigger names that weren't at, at the competition in years past are probably gonna be there. Um, and it just becomes a, a more meaningful experience, but it doesn't really change the plan. Our plan was still to go there. It kind of just, it made it a little more exciting. I wouldn't say necessarily more pressure as I was just going out there to do the same thing I kind of planned on before and that was to go out there and win. The Dubai CrossFit Championships and will be the first announced sanctioned qualifying event. So since this being my third trip, I kind of had a much better understanding of what's to come and what's gonna be happening relative to the team who had no real idea of what it's like over there. You hear like all these stories about how crazy of a place it is. They're the tallest building in the world. I think the, it's called the Burj Khalifa. There's a seven star hotel. There's a mall that has all this crazy stuff inside of it, ski slopes, aquarium. And you can't really fathom a place that exists like that, or at least in the US, there's nothing. I mean, I guess Las Vegas is probably the closest comparison. So there's a big part of it. There's just like childlike excitement. Like, oh, I wanna go see this place and see what it's all about. See what people are talking about. This major destination in the Middle East. So I think our whole team, coaches, athletes, Chris, like we were just excited to get out there and see what it was all about. So the day before we leave, I get, I start to get this like weird tickle in my throat and I'm like, no, no, it's not happening. I'm not getting sick. And then like a couple hours later, I'm full blown sick. Like, I can't swallow, my throat's so sore. I can't breathe through my nose. I slept the entire day ahead of time. And then I was, I was contemplating, should I go? Should I not go? Am I gonna get everyone sick? Is it gonna be like this horrible experience? I decided to just go and try not to make a big deal about it. I didn't want anyone to know that I was feeling as bad as I was feeling. I'm a baby when I'm sick in general. So the whole travel experience was crappy and I was just internal the whole time thinking about how badly I wanted to be off the plane. Then we get to Amsterdam. Travis must have eaten something. Uh, and so he's throwing up. Oh, like, give me a minute, I got it, I'll be back. So I ended up going to the bathroom, throwing up once, throwing up twice, threw up one more time, I think, in the bathroom at that point. Ended up going and sitting back down by our terminal or gate. 15 minutes later, went back, threw up two more times, came back and was a new man. Um, and felt great the rest of the trip, but definitely going out, I was very paranoid because my wife wasn't feeling well, my, both my boys were sick. Max was actually sick flying out there and I thought I was getting what he had and I was just getting paranoid. And it was driving me nuts that I was about to punch Max in the face for riding next to me on the plane, except I chose that seat so it's technically my fault. Thankfully nothing happened from that and it was just something I ate prior to the plane and 
got it all out before we actually got into Dubai and felt 100% once we were there, but that was definitely a little frustrating flying out and not feeling 100%. So we wake up Monday morning and me, Travis, Chris, Mike have been there for a day because we got in on like late Saturday night or early Sunday morning. So we had all Sunday to acclimate. Then some of the team members and my individual female athlete, Caroline Dardini, got in on Sunday night. So they got to, they slept in and we decided to have a little bit of a later start date. First thing we do is we go to the beach because they announced some beach events and we know there's gonna be some sort of swimming. So we wanna get some open water exposure and kind of immerse ourselves in the environment. Uh, the trip there was kind of comical. We find out Mike was kind of our resident tour guide. Tour guide Mike. Tour guide Mike. Tour guide Mike. He was the best tour guide. That was kind of, needless to say, an adventure. He took us on the longest bus ride ever. He's like, ooh, we, you know, instead of taking cabs, we have this free beach shuttle we'll take. So we get in the beach shuttle and we think it's gonna be a 20 minute ride. We end up in a bus for like an hour and 15 minutes stopping at a water park. We had no idea where we were going. So just taking an Uber. So by the time we left the hotel to this other hotel where the beach actually was, was about an hour, hour and a half. And we finally end up at the, uh, at the water. We're driving by the water and everyone looks over and they're like, oh my God, that's so choppy. There's so much waves. We're not gonna be able to swim in that. We end up being on the other side of, I guess like wherever the, the land mass was set up. We were on like a little intercoastal side. So it was very flat, very nice, beautiful water. Everyone was super excited about it, which is gonna set the tone for the fact that on Wednesday, there were a ton of waves uh, that I think got in our athlete's head just a little bit because they weren't expecting that after the kind of like flat, smooth waters that we got to swim in on that day. I was like, all right, let's go to the beach. Let's get a swim workout in, get you guys used to the water and you know, just practice like some urgency of like getting in the water and racing and stuff. They did, went for a little run. They did some uh, mixed intervals with squatting and then going into the water and just getting acclimated to open water swimming. And I pulled Joey to the side before uh, this first like swim workout that we did. And I said, look, you're the best swimmer on this team. Like I need you to step up and be the leader. I need you to get these guys warm, get them focused and like have them ready to jump in the water and go. He's like, yeah, yeah, cool. Three, two, one, go. They start the workout. Joey's the first one in the water. And he just stops and he's like, he's, he stalls for a minute out in the water. And he's like looking around and I'm like, what's he doing? He's like waiting on the team. I'm, I'm like, start yelling, like, Joey, go. It's like for time, like it's individual, go. And he like doesn't go anywhere. And then Kyle catches up to him and Kyle's like sitting there for a minute looking around. And all of a sudden I hear Kyle saying, he's, he's freaking out. <laughs> and I'm like, what is happening? Joey's the best swimmer. Like, what's he freaking out about? Kyle Googles it and we found, find out that there's tiger sharks, which I think are, he Googled some of some of the deadliest sharks and next thing we know, we jump in the water there and Joey's panicking because he's terrified that sharks are gonna come after him. As soon as I stopped, I was pretty convinced there were sharks in the water and I was freaking out. I mean, it turns out, you know, like we were giving him shit about it, but like he was legitimately scared of the sharks. Which is weird considering he is our best swimmer and he is an amazing swimmer. We had to kind of like talk him down a little bit, you know, and like make up, you know, fake stories like it's not gonna happen out here like based on the season right now the salt water's too high so the fish don't come this close to, or the, the sharks don't come this close to shore just make it up wherever we could to make them feel better and like you know like give uh, ease, ease them down a little bit it was not a great training session I think everybody's bodies were just kind of a little out of whack from changing time zones the travel the being in a novel environment sitting in the bus for an hour and 10 minutes so it definitely wasn't perfect but it was just a fun experience to kind of go out there and just hang out as a crew and get in the water. So Monday ends up being the first real day that we have in Dubai. Our priority was to like get some training in, just make sure that everyone's acclimated and understanding that they're like getting their body ready for the fact that we're over there in this foreign place on a new time zone, but our bodies or their bodies need to be able to perform. So we went to Dunes CrossFit. We just got a training session in. Some of the workouts had been released, so Travis was using it to get a feel for the snatch and clean and jerk. Um, 15 snatch, 15 clean and jerk at 90 kilos and 110 kilos. So he was trying to get a feel for what his pacing would look like. We knew that the max snatch was out, so he tried to get a feel for his snatch and just build up to something to get a little bit more comfortable in his mind for where he was gonna try to open in the competition. 
you can't really plan too much on these days ahead of time because you don't know the standard of the actual workout. They put the workout out on Instagram, but then you get more details when you go to the competition about how long do you have to lift? How many attempts? Do you set the weight ahead of time or do you get to pick it? So a lot of that was just kind of sharpening. Everything that day felt really good, so it kind of made me feel pretty confident going into the competition. Hit a 265 snatch, really easy. And for me, just kind of, and that builds confidence when I know it's a good snatch day. It just kind of helps me feel confident overall on everything. So the team was there as well. Mike came with us and his role was to be the in-person team coach while we were there. So they decided to do a bunch of synchro work and a bunch of team communication stuff just to do some final touch-up work on uh, being a cohesive team. Let's train as a team and let's just like do the best we can with the workouts that involve teamwork. And like, that's a big strength for these guys. You know, they like had all been on site together. They spent a lot of time together the last several months. Then we find out uh, shortly after that there really wasn't any teamwork in the competition. And we're just like, fuck. At first I thought it was a joke. Uh, they, during the athlete briefing, just kind of skipped over team stuff. And then they came back and we realized we really were doing this individually. You're looking at the workouts and they say, okay, one male is gonna do this workout. One female is gonna do this workout and that's it. And I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe they'll have like 15 workouts. So we all get to at least do one workout by ourselves, And then there will be team workouts mixed in. I kind of felt deflated almost to an extent because we had practiced so much teamwork, synchro work, worm work that we were hoping we'd be able to showcase our team like unity that we had built the past month so it was kind of deflating when we found out that they were individual workouts so it took me a while to wrap my head around the fact that we really were going to be doing this individually when we had felt so solid as a team there's obviously some frustrations about that because one of our team members one of our team members doesn't live here he lives in arizona and he moved his life out here to make sure that we had somewhat of a competitive edge from a communication standpoint, from a synchronization standpoint, and making sure that our, our unit are, could actually compete as a team. We took him away from family through the holidays, his girlfriend through the holidays, and I just felt bad that he ended up making that sacrifice for us when he could have just stayed back home, which it meant, meant a lot. We built a lot of chemistry, but I felt bad. I can't imagine how he must have felt, um, but I never heard him once complain about it. Uh, if anything, I think it motivated him more and fueled the fire, gave him a little bit of aggression for the competition. So finding out after the fact that all of the work that we did ahead of time from a preparation standpoint was irrelevant, kind of sucks, but that is kind of what competitions are. So you have to make peace with it as quick as possible and just figure out like, all right, well, it is what it is. New landscape of the sport. Other people are in control of the rules right now. And now we just need to accept the rules and figure out how to play as best as possible within those rules. So that training session ended up actually being a, a, a non-factor, something that was really just used as a last minute way to kind of get sweating, get moving, and kind of get acclimated to the new environment as a team. But it didn't really do anything like from a peaking or preparation standpoint that made us feel more confident on game day when we actually found out what the workouts were. So even though we didn't get to spend much time together as a team on the competition floor, we did take advantage of being together um, on our downtime. We went into Dubai and saw this huge water fountain. It was awesome. It was synced up with Enrique's uh, I Can Be Your Hero Baby. Uh, it was actually kind of beautiful, um, but it was playing in Spanish and then we got to go in the tallest building in the world. This is just something I, th I think the new landscape of the sport has kind of opened up the opportunity for a lot of us to get a chance to travel. And I think it's cool because we get to travel with a group of people that we care about, that we're with on a day-to-day -day basis, and we're all kind of excited to go do these things together. So it's cool to just kind of, you know, we're in a new environment where the purpose is competing, but we still have the opportunity to just kind of go see some cool things. So we get the VIP experience, go all the way to the top of the building. Chris also did virtual reality simulation where he jumped off of it, which um, you should definitely put in there. You're unfathomably high, you're looking down, there's this huge landscape of skyscrapers that are really tall. When you're standing on the ground and looking at the normal skyscrapers, they're really tall. But then when you're at the world's tallest building looking down on them, just think it just kind of gives you a, a really interesting perspective. You can see super far out into the deserts and there's these pockets of skyscrapers that are out and built with barren landscape of desert in between. And I think it's just a, 
Uh, it's a testament to what the human spirit can do in a short period of time. So day one's all beach events. It's a pretty beautiful landscape. We're at this huge, nice resort style hotel. The Seven Star Hotel is off to our right hand side. And there was a lot of fear going on. So the, the waves were, were way bigger than we had anticipated, which I talked a little bit about, which I think got in our heads. Everyone kept talking about sharks and Joey was paranoid about a shark attack happening to him. So Joey's slowly getting more comfortable and understanding that He's gonna feel better in the open water. Everybody kind of talked him down, told him it was gonna be A-OK. -okay. And then randomly, the day before, we were all sitting down at dinner, and one of our other athletes, Andrea Nissler, who is on, she was on Team Omnicide, came over to the table. She's talking, we're just kind of like, you know, hanging out. And then she's like, oh, you know, there's a ton of jellyfish in the water, and I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> like, no, like, shut up. Hey, did you hear about the jellyfish? Now he's concerned about the jellyfish. Then he pretty much is right back on the ledge and he's falling. <laughs> you know, that's pretty funny that it happened. So it's just kind of like a, a funny way to set the tone for the open water swim events on day one. Um, nothing really notable on the actual workout, or at least the first workout. It was 21.59, double kettlebell snatch, front squat, and they run into the water, do a 350 meter swim, out to a buoy, around another buoy, back in, and then run to your starting mat to finish. So we finished event one out at the beach, and there wasn't really an announcement or anything of what was happening for event two. All we really knew was an 800 meter run and then another 350 meter swim. Travis comes over, I'm sitting in one of these little huts trying to stay out of the sun. Travis comes over and he's like, the freaking waves are so rough that the event organizers decided that we have to wear, uh, we have to bring lifeguard rafts with us while we swim. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Like we, we just, everyone just swam and it was just as rough. Nothing has changed. Why are they doing that? You can tell everybody's a little flustered because no one really knew what was happening. We all thought it was for a safety reason. This is going on for 10 or 15 minutes before Travis realized the event name is Baywatch and that was just something they added to the event to make it a little bit more difficult. Okay, now it's fine. So the difference being the lifeguards have this big floating hot dog type inner tube thing, but it's connected to them via a strap. So they could swim out with it strapped onto them, find somebody that's drowning, have them hang onto it, swim back. The athletes basically just have the big inner tube thing without any strap. And the major stipulation of the workout is that you can't lose this inner tube. If you lose it, goes out to sea, whatever, if you come back without it, you DNF the workout, you get zero points, and you can't win any money in any of the other events in that day. So if you'd already been in a top three spot in, one, in the earlier workout, you don't get that prize money. So that's the big portion of the workout. Like so what everyone's thinking about, how do I hold on to it? How do I swim with it? How do I ensure it doesn't go out? Travis runs over to the lifeguards and gets some advice about how to do that. Some said in between their legs, some said put it on your hips, on your chest. I felt like none of them were really on the same page about what was easier. I guess clearly they all had a different version. Vent starts, Trav's going out, swimming. He's looks like he's in the lead pack. We're pretty excited about his entrance into the water because in the first workout, he kind of went in a little bit conservatively and lost a bunch of ground. So he gets out a little bit more aggressively through the waves. He's with the lead pack. He's coming in and then he loses the damn inner tube. Split second was pure panic that I thought it was going backwards and then I was like, wait, I'm going with the waves, it's in my favor. So I kind of, once I felt it go, I was like, oh no, and then I was like, just swim in. So then I just took off swimming in and then it was probably 20, 30 yards to my right, sprinted over there, grabbed it, and then went in. So I mean, it might have played in my favor that it actually flew off, but it, I did not throw it, it legitimately the wave took that one. Takes fourth, he's at a Frasier, which is always just a nice thing to get in an event.
So from a team perspective on that workout, I think the only notable thing is just I want to shout out to Joey really quickly. So the day before I said we went to, or on Monday, we went and did that open water work. Joey swam in high school, really competent swimmer, went out to the water and had like a panic attack about the sharks. And now we're all worried about Joey's swimming execution on game day, but he ended up going out there. One athlete had to carry the inner tube. So Brandy did the run portion, went the inner tube. Joey goes into the water and like passes six people on the way in and they get onto the podium in that workout. Him running in, uh, we were all really excited. He had that euphoric feeling racing to the assault runner. Um, that was awesome. That felt like a team thing. We were all there when he finished. We were all super excited. It was just like a, a really good, funny, positive, just high energy moment to make like, A, he didn't have a panic attack in the water and B, he got to kind of have this awesome athletic experience at one of these new sanctioned events. I was swimming faster because I knew that there was a little bit of cash on the line and I kind of didn't want to get eaten by a shark. Day two was a desert run. 4K out with a weighted vest, 4K back. Probably a 45 to hour minute drive out to the desert run. And when you originally pull up, it's completely flat. And you can see everybody on the bus is getting super excited. Like, oh, it's gonna be flat. And I knew right away that that was all a lie, that, that we're definitely not starting there. Or if we are, it's right past the tree line and it's gonna be dunes. I rode out there with Saud, one of like the main guys who runs the event. And uh, you know, it was fun to like ride out there and just kind of like talk about culture and experience of competing. like you know, at, in Dubai in like years past and what it's gonna look like in the future. And then we get out there and like it's, I mean, it's, it's the desert, it's flat, there's nothing out there. So everybody gets off, everybody's feeling confident, talking about it, and then they say you're gonna run 500 meters out and then you're gonna kind of just follow the flags from there. So we take off and then you can see everybody kind of, not panic, but just kind of start to realize that this isn't gonna be a smooth, easy run. A few people started off and I mean, they were probably at like five something minute miles and I just, throttle back and for me that's usually the hard part but I was probably in I'd say 15th 20th place and I was just running comfortable. The softness of the sand and what that did to the, the, the steep hill climbs and just how difficult it was to actually propel yourself up steep hills in soft sand. When you're stepping you're just sinking almost to like mid shin almost to your knee of just going in and there's no flat once you get out there it's all just up down up down the whole way through. And then on the way back everyone commented about just how difficult it was and how hot it was overall. Like literally every 30 minutes, you can feel the temperature rising like 15 degrees or something. Um, so I, I don't know, I mean, it was cool to experience a competition like that in an element that like no one has dealt with before, like in the States. Competing with Frazier is always something that you have to show up on any workout. And if you're wanting to beat him, you have to win and capitalize on every little point you can. So I think the first one when he ended up winning, everybody's like, oh, he's off to that start again. Um, but then the second one, I think, I don't know what his placement was, but it definitely wasn't towards the top. It was probably an eighth or 10th somewhere in that ballpark. So I ended up beating him in that and that just kind of like builds confidence, I think for me. Um, I mean, other people probably experience it. And, but then going into day two, doing it to get on the run, it just kind of, even built more confidence that if you are executing on workouts, there are ways he can be beaten. Um, but then you go back after that and the dude wins seven events and you can't really say anything about that. I mean, he executes really well in competition, but it definitely shows that there are areas that all athletes need to, when you can beat him, beat him and make up the points. Cause after that, once you start getting in the CrossFit, he does pretty good. <laughs> So we get the off-site events out of the way. Day one, day two, off-site with the swim and with the run. Now we're in the tennis stadium. We get a feel for what the, what are the actual CrossFit spectator events gonna be in this sanctioned event format. So first workout was a max snatch. Second workout was a workout that had a really heavy yoke, muscle ups and box jumps, and then a really heavy yoke to finish. Third workout was kind of a cyclical sprint with a ski erg, then a row, and then a bike erg to finish. 
the, the notable things that I saw on that day were I really liked the format of the snatch. It was just simple. They had a time frame. They could take as many lifts as they, they wanted. Team ended up taking third on that, which was a huge surprise for us and pretty cool to have a podium finish for them and secure some money in one of the earlier days. Second workout was just a really heavy yoke. And the yoke on the second half of that workout was just like rocking everybody's bodies. I know it kind of panicked Trav. Um, and our team athlete got really held up with that thing, couldn't, couldn't walk the whole distance with it. So I think that just kind of sets the tone for how, how difficult, how heavy, how advanced the athletes are gonna have to be over the course of the next seasons as this new sport develops because event organizers are not gonna hold back when they put out loading thresholds for specific workouts. So that was the only thing notable there. And the final event, just a really straightforward max effort sprint race. 500 meter skier, 500 meter row, 1K biker, sprint to the finish line. It was cool to see just people's wills and capacities put to the highest level under the lights as the final event of day three. Um, it was funny to watch people get off the bike ergs and they had to sprint like 20 or 30 feet and people were like falling over. They couldn't get their legs to work to finish. So you just like have a real good appreciation for how far people are willing to go for points on the leaderboard and uh, that the sport just really means something to a lot of people. So it was cool to watch like just maximal output on the final workout of that day. After three days, one day of competition left, obviously you gotta start looking at the leaderboard now and kind of seeing where you fit in and try to set some expectations for the final day. So Trav's just off the podium in fourth place. I kind of sat kind of in the hotel, planned out where I thought I could capitalize on Willie, BKG, and Matt and hopefully make up some points to put me on the podium spot. Our teams, in, I think they were in fifth at that point. Um, we qualified in 10th, so expectations were kind of like, all right, well, we wanna be on the podium, we wanna do as well as possible, but there's a bunch of games athletes and other games teams that have been there and like, you know, we qualified in last, so how do we really set expectations at that point? So being in fifth, being in the middle of the pack in such a competitive field, I feel like everyone's headspace was in a pretty good place, everyone's bodies felt pretty good, and everyone was kind of ready to attack the final day. So four workouts on the final day, pretty intense day. Starts with 963 rope climb handstand walk, 40 meters on the handstand walk each round, where you had to do 10 meters unbroken, so it was 20 meters. You had to get 10, which is 30 feet basically, unbroken each segment. Second workout was pick up a sandbag, run a certain distance with it, come back, run over, do burpee box jump overs, run to an assault bike, do assault bike cows, come back, burpee box jump overs, and then finish with the sandbag run again. Third workout was 15 snatch, 15 clean and jerk at a relatively heavy weight. And then the finale workout, which was a series of a bunch of different little mini workouts. So bar muscle ups and then burpee clean and jerks. They call them devil's presses, but they were too heavy to actually just like swing in one motion. So it ended up being do a burpee clean and jerk, then toes to bar and double unders, then wall balls and power cleans, and then finishing with an overhead walking lunge. That was really a turning point for the team though and kind of a turning point in a negative way. So we go in, we're in fifth place, pretty good expectations, pretty good motivation, everyone's kind of ready. We know that this workout's tough. We kind of, we had to pick one female to do it. So we're between Brandy and Cal to decide who's gonna do this specific workout. Brandy's a little bit more confident with the handstand walk side of it, and then Cal's more confident with the short rope climb side of it. We ended up pulling the trigger on picking Cal as the person to do it, and there were a couple mistakes as she was going out in the handstand walk, some falls, hit hands outside the line, having to get called back, and the bummer about the whole situation is that there was a minimum work requirement of having to finish the nine rope climbs and the handstand walk down and back, and we didn't meet that. Oh my gosh, that was terrible. I struggle, I guess, in the moment of competition and you know, you're frustrated and then the frustration happens and you're staring at the clock and you overthink, picked up, started walking. I always have a hard time walking in a straight line. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I can make a million excuses, but there's no 
real excuse for how terrible that felt. I am failing <laughs> miserably and it was the worst because I'm out there by myself. The team picked me to do that and um, put their faith in me on that and I failed like that. It sucked so bad. You know, watching uh, an athlete go through a struggle like that is extremely painful. Like, you want to be out there and, like, do it for them or help or just do whatever you can to, like, just make them not have to suffer through that. Probably one of the hardest things that I've had to watch, I would say, in CrossFit from the stands. We're a team. One of my, she's my teammate. She was out there on the floor by herself. I wasn't able to help her. None of us were able to help her, whether it was encourage her, give her tips, because we had to sit in the stands. If I could just get in her head and say like, just focus, get through it, like maintain your composure. You're failing right now, but like this is all part of it. Like every athlete has to fail to learn from it. Like the, find one athlete who's at the top of their game right now that hasn't failed tremendously on the biggest stage. You know, like the best athletes are the ones that bounce back from that. Like there's not really anything you can say. It's not like, oh, you know, you tried your best. It's like, it kind of sucked. Um, sucks for us. <laughs> um, like nobody like sugarcoated it. That was actually like, I feel like it was better. The fact that it was like, you know, I mean, it was what it was. I'm not gonna lie and say, hey, you did a great job. <laughs> Good effort. It's kind of a bummer of a situation, but again, those I think are the moments of sport that build our character and really test our resolve as athletes about what we want our legacy to be like in the future and kind of start to dial in our training. If that's a, uh, a weakness that got exposed, now it's a, a good platform to say like, all right, well now we gotta get better at this if this is gonna be something we need to work on in the future. Every year at Dubai, there's been a huge story around the prize money and the prize purse that this competition in the Middle East is offering. And so it's always interesting to figure out like, well, what are they gonna do this time to you know, top the fact that they're already paying out prize money that is, aside from the games, it's higher than any other competition that's out there. And they say $30,000 to win the final event. So that perks everybody up. Oh, snap. <laughs> this could pay for our trip and another trip. <laughs> You'll find a new gear you didn't know you had. So I'm actually sitting in the hotel. I just talked to my wife on the phone and boys, and I told them I was gonna go out and win this workout. Um, I was like, this is, I was like, in my mind I didn't make a lot of money and relative to the years past. Um, so I really wanted to kind of go out with a bang and win this final workout because usually they doubled it or even if they didn't, I would still be happy walking away, finishing out as hard as I possibly could. Um, 10 minutes after that, after talking with her, telling her I'm gonna win it, I get a message that says, final workout, 30K. And then originally I was like, all right, got myself fired up. I started listening to my kill switch engage, started getting angry, uh, and then called my wife again. I was like, you won't believe it. They just raised it to 30,000. 30, she goes, good, you better go win. So $30,000 is like an annual salary for some people. And now it's like, all right, you can do, you know, Less than 15 minutes of work at max effort and have the potential to earn this in a single workout. And that level of pressure is something that I don't think most people are accustomed to, to feeling, but that really like perks up the competitive environment and just brings out like a whole nother level of seriousness from a competitive standpoint. I was pretty fired up. We go into the back, we start warming up. I'm feeling pretty good. Um, you're sitting there watching kind of other athletes move. You can see everybody's getting a little sore, stiff. I was just kind of using it as fuel, um, especially with the devil's press, the 85s in each hand were definitely a struggle for people. So I knew those were areas that I could kind of capitalize on and hopefully pull away and get in front with this workout early on. Um, in the back, actually, I was touch and going the cleans and Frazier looks at me and goes, are you gonna be doing that in the workout? And I said, for 30,000, you bet I am. He's also right out of contention with the podium, so he had like this extra incentive to make sure that he brought his best effort into that final workout.
So anytime Frazier's in the field, you know like he's probably got a realistic potential to win a workout, especially if they put that much on the line. It's a finale, it's all CrossFit stuff, you know that's probably your favorite and everyone's talking about it. So I go into the stands and I'm just thinking like, I hope Trav just brings his best and put some pressure on him. Like bring a race to the game, like make it more exciting. Don't let this guy run away with it. So goes out, first portion of the workout, muscle ups and uh, devil's press with 85 pounds. They go through the first portion of that. The field's starting to separate just a little bit, but not too much. Frazier's taking a relatively big lead. And then there's a kind of that backpack with Travis, BKG, Willie George, and a couple of the other guys from the final heat. Next portion of the workout, double unders, toes to bar. And I'm watching, and obviously like watching in that field, I'm always watching a little bit the leaders of the race. And then most of the time I spend, I just watch and focus on Travis. So he, got, he does all his toes to bar and every one of the set unbroken, goes over, does his double unders unbroken. I then jump up to second place. And then now I see it's pretty much like me and Frazier going back and forth from the wall ball to cleans. And now Trav has basically separated himself from the rest of the pack. Oh dude, he's gonna do it. He's gonna go unbroken on these 30 pound wall balls. Wall balls are used to my jam. It's one of his best movements. He's gonna put the pressure on. He's gonna touch and go the power cleans. I didn't. He's gonna catch him. You could see when Travis approached his last set of power cleans that Matt kind of paused, looked over, and was at least aware that there was somebody else in the race. Got to the cleans, and I could see him kind of watching me. Which is not always the case with Matt. Sometimes he's so far ahead that he's kind of throttled back because he's created such a lead, but at least felt some pressure from Travis pushing, which is kind of like a moment of pride, knowing like you have this whole field of people, stakes have been raised, everybody's giving their best effort that, at that point, and really the only person in the field that has separated themselves from Travis is somebody that has won the games three consecutive times and pretty much won everything that he's entered into in the last three years. I mean, it's definitely cool knowing you're going head to head with the fittest man on earth um, who's definitely backed it up for years, so it's definitely cool to do that, but it also shows that it just adds more confidence to me and belief in myself going forward for other competitions that if I'm willing to execute and push a little harder that there's no reason I shouldn't be at the games and performing with the top five athletes contending for a podium spot. He ended up not finishing or not passing Matt, finishing second in the workout. But again, I think it was just a moment, like a, a strong moment to finish and kind of gave some concluding thoughts for me and Travis. Like, look, you have this inside of you. You have the ability to put pressure on the best athlete in the world when the stakes are high. You've done it to finish a regional, to make sure that you get a, a qualifying bid to the games. You do it when all this stuff is on the line. Now the only difference is you being able to bring that on every single event from start to finish throughout a competition and just hold yourself to the standard that you hold yourself to when there's something really meaningful and potent. So that's really what we've been working on with Trav. We know he's got the tools. We know he's been there. We know that the elite competitors respect his capabilities and now it's just a matter of like putting it all together. And I thought Dubai was a pretty good step in that direction. Pretty good execution from start to finish. No really low finishes. It just didn't, aside from that final workout moment, it just lacked enough of those to really separate himself and really put pressure on, uh, on being on the top of the podium. But it was a really cool moment, just a good experience. I think that's one thing over this whole, the last from Granite Games to now Dubai is that I'm not second guessing myself and I'm finally believing in all of my abilities and what I'm capable of doing. Even now with training, I feel like with what me and Max have going on, it has me kind of excited for what's to come and not dreading like, oh, doing this again, doing this, that I feel confident saying I'm going for podium spots or I'm going to win. And that's kind of all I'm going after. So final workout ends, our flight out is that night. So it was kind of a really fast turnaround. I went back to the hotel and just kind of had like a little bit of time, an hour or so just by myself to pack my stuff up and reflect. And we were there for a while. I mean, you go to this foreign country and we're there for um, nine days and hanging out with friends, colleagues, seeing people that I've seen around the CrossFit community for a long time. And it was, a, uh, I just left like, feeling pretty good about the whole experience. Even though from a competitive standpoint, it didn't really go like as well as possible. No podiums, no wins. It was just a, a moment where I realized that 
for a living. I get to hang out with people that I consider friends, go to these competitive events and watch people that I really respect put themselves on the line. I mean, it's one thing to hear critics talk about how people execute or people talk about winners or talk about the best competitors, but when you're really in it, most competitors are out there grinding and trying to get to the top and putting everything they have out there to watch their expectations not met. And for me, that is really what competition is all about. Evan actually wrote a social media post and talked about competition being a rite of passage. And I really agree with that, that each time we go to these, one of these things, we learn more about the people that we're spending our time with in our inner circle. We learn more about the community that we're taking a part of as a whole. In this situation, we learn more just about humanity in general, because we go out to this foreign country and get to be a tourist for a little while. And it was just a, a really awesome experience. And you kind of have this like sad state that like, all right, it's over now and I'm gonna kind of go back to the grind, but it puts you in kind of this refocus format where you're like, all right, well, when's the next one? Like, I'm ready. And uh, that's what I looked forward to from a competitive standpoint, is finding people that like to do that, that like to put themselves out on the line to, um, to see what they're made of. Ay, sin dudar, tu vida entera dar, como yo la doy por ti. single-handedly saved a whole bunch of puppies from a burning animal hospital with the music that I put on with him and Matt. You think it's too much? <laughs> if you want more information on our one-on-one personal coaching, our competitors program, our online courses, or any upcoming camps, head over to trainingthinktank.com.